Are we on? Here we are. We're trying to record. Once again, I'd say we're having fun trying to do it. This is the third week of trying to put together a little something for all of us, myself especially. It keeps me into the Word of God and it keeps me into where I really have to eat, drink, sleep, breathe, run, ride on certain scriptures for basically a whole week. I want to thank you for being with me on this. This is the third week of Lent and the scripture I chose for this week is the Old Testament lesson. It reads like this from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horab, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the mis misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the count country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perserites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. It shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now just be with us. And help us to grow deeper on our relationship with you. For that's what we've created for. That's what we truly live for. And that's what really gives us life. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, it's interesting. As I was preparing for this, I, I, I read these scriptures and they just struck out right away at me a certain point. And that certain point was just this how often we do things to get attention i mean think about it what are some of the things that you've done in your life to get attention you know any male especially probably a female but i can relate more to the men i uh, you know would say they did all kinds of crazy things to get attention from a girl you know especially when they were growing up they acted a certain way, they did a certain behavior, they dressed a certain way. You know, I can honestly say that, you know, I, I tried to get attention many times through the way I dressed or the way I didn't dress so well. You know, I, I, I can say this, I probably have dressed like Davy Crockett when I was a youngster. And when I was probably in my 30s, I dressed like Sonny Crockett just to get some attention. In the scripture that we have today, 
we're told that God has been trying to get Moses' attention. And he dressed in a really interesting way. God dresses in the form of a burning bush that's not consumed. It says that he's been like that. And Moses is wandering out in the desert. Here he is, don't forget, Moses' life, the first 40 years. He was basically raised as an Egyptian, although full well knowing as an Israelite. The second 40 years up to this point, he's been in the desert because he ran away, because he murdered somebody, and he's hiding out. He's on the lam, and he ends up going out there, starting a family, getting a new identity, in a sense, all over again. And he married one of Jethro's daughters, and, and, and here he is, tending the flocks of his father-in-law. He's there. Probably been there a thousand times, right at the base of Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. <clears throat> and there he, this time, he sees a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. It's interesting. Because the moment he sees it, he wants to go over and say, well, what? what's causing this about? You know, you got my attention. Little did he know that it wasn't the bush that got his attention. It was God in the bush that got his attention. When he gets over there, all of a sudden God says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. I'm the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, the God of Father. And I hear the cry of my people Israel, and I'm going to send you back. I'm going to send you back. I'm going to send you back so that you can lead the people out. It always makes me laugh when he tells Moses to do that. You know, Moses immediately tries to get out. Well, you know, who am I to go? I, you know, I, don't send me. I mean, even later on in the scripture, he bargains with him to send not him, but his brother. But God says, no, I want you to go. I want you to go. God is always calling. But before he calls, he's always trying to get your attention. You know, you ever think he's tried to get your attention? Maybe in the things that you, you know, have passed by. I wonder how many times he's tried to get your attention through life circumstances where things fall apart and he so desperately wants to put them back together with you, but you don't pay attention. You just want to have the job done. You don't really want your life put together. You just want to have your life the way you want it to continue in the form that you want it. But God is always calling in the midst of getting your attention. Right now he's calling you. But first, he's getting your attention. And he's probably getting your attention in so many different ways. Sometimes by other relationships, sometimes by things that have come together, sometimes by things that have come apart. Yeah, let me just be real clear here. This isn't the first time Moses must have known that God was trying to get his attention. Look at his whole life. When he's born, even when he's just an infant, they have to put him in basically a reed raft, shove him down the Nile, because if he's kept at home, he's going to be killed. And he's put in a reed raft, shoved down the Nile, and who picks him up? The daughter of Pharaoh, and the daughter of Pharaoh adopts him and brings him into his house, and he's raised as an Egyptian, although his mother is his nanny the whole time. You want about, you know, a little bit of, you know, a little bit confusion in your life? Let's face it. You know you're a Jew who all the other people that are born at your time that are men or boys have been killed, but you somehow were spared, and you're raised in the king of the foreign country you're in's house. At this point, he's raised to be a pharaoh. He's raised to be a ruler. But when he sees injustice going on, he takes matters into his own hands. He doesn't check in with God. He just says, I'm going to do it. That's wrong what there's going on. I'm going to kill the other guy. That's when all of a sudden he thinks he's going to be a hero because the Jews are going to, and the Jews say, you're the guy that killed. You're, he, he's the Israelite that killed that Egyptian. So he gets scared and he runs off. He wanders in, but lo and behold, what happens? He finds a family in the middle of the desert, nomads. He starts to have a family of his own. In a way, I think he probably tried to change his identity. Change the identity that I had 
so he could have a new identity. You know, sometimes when we go through our own life, we try and change our identity. How many times have you changed your identity? Well, you thought, well, I, I just, I won't change my behaviors, but I'll just try and be something that I wasn't before. You see, identity and behavior have to go together because that's what congruency is, and that's what the Lord leads us to more than else. Do you realize that the Lord is calling you to congruency? Do you realize that right at this moment, he in so many different ways is trying to get a word edgewise by getting your attention so that you can be congruent, so that you can be what you say is what you get, where you can be one with yourself, because then when you're one with yourself, you have a chance to be one with God. It doesn't take brain surgery to figure it out. To be honest with you, most of us seek the things that we want and can't understand why we don't get them instead of saying, why don't we figure out who we are and then God will give us what we want. Moses, although he's called by God to go and lead the people out, at this point still doesn't realize what all that means. That's understandable. It's the beginning of everything. It's an encounter that Although God's been knocking at the heart of his, the door of his heart all along, this is the first real encounter he's had with God. But it's interesting to me that the next thing that goes on is God looks at him and says, No, I'm sending you, Moses. I'm not sending anybody else. You're the one that's going to go in there. You're going to tell him that my name is I am who I am. You're going to tell him that I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You know enough of your history. They know enough of their history. So all of it will come together. But you are the one that I'm sending. And the how you're going to know that I have sent you and how they'll know he's sent you is that after you go and you get them and you bring them out, you're going to worship me on this mountain. You know, that always made me laugh. You'll know for sure, because this is the sign that you'll know that you'll worship me on this mountain. But you know what? It was quite a bit of time, months, years, before they get to that mountain to worship God on that mountain, to really worship him, and they have to go through all the plagues in Egypt first. He's got to go in front of Pharaoh. He's got to lead the people out. He's got to lead him through you know, the Red Sea, he's got to get them out. He's got to have them almost die of thirst. He's got all these events that go on before. And then finally, they end up at Mount Horeb where they do worship at him. So I guess that was proof. But the proof doesn't come until after. It doesn't come on the front end. You know, most of us want guarantees on the front end. I'm sorry to tell you, I, I, I haven't found guarantees of that I'll get what, you know, I'm going to get or it'll work out perfectly. The only guarantee I have is I'm going to love you and I'm never going to give up on you. That's the only guarantee I've ever felt with God. I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to work with you. I'm always going to have my hands on you, molding and shaping you. And the more you pay attention to me and the more, in a sense, you give me your attention instead of trying to get my attention, the more you give me attention, the more I'm going to mold and shape you, the faster we're going to get this job done, and the more you're going to become who you're called to be, and you will become the man who you will like, the man who you will trust, the woman that you will like, the woman you will trust. Because, you see, God is with us. He never leaves us. He goes with us into all things. He's always present. Sometimes I have a real hard time paying attention to all that he's doing in my life. Because I get so busy with my own stuff. I'm really much more after my own will than I am his will. Or I try and make it more complicated. I think, no, what is his will in my life? And I try and make it bigger and greater. The real thing 
that Jesus really says that's close to doing the will of God? When he asks, is, he's asked, what must we do to do the work of God? The only thing Jesus ever says is, the work of God is believing in the one who he sent. Believing. It's not easy, but it's not complicated. It's believing in Jesus in every situation in your life. Instead of trying to get God to fix out the things in your life that you want fixed, move towards believing in God in the situations that are unfixed. Because when you believe in God in the situations that are unfixed, somehow God will enter into you, transform you from a little bit less what you are right now into a little bit more of what you ought to be, and move you to the place where, to be real up front with you, things will all come together. On this third Lent, that's the message that God gave to me as I looked at these scriptures all week. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, <laughs> it takes three of you to get my attention. Sometimes you double team me and sometimes you even have to triple team me. But when I do finally give you the attention, when I do finally listen and I don't let my mind drift off to my imaginary world but I rather focus on the reality of the spiritual life of walking with you my life is full my life is whole and the person that I'm called to be somehow blossoms and flowers like never before help us to do that this day in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.